Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Indie Zor Education. Uh, today we will talk about space. Uh, not about space exploration. No, space is the place where our physical processes actually take place. So if time, which is the subject of the previous lecture, answered the question when something happened, uh, the space answers the question where it happened. Now, um, we obviously understand intuitively what space around us actually is, um, uh, and, and that's not the purpose of this lecture. <laughs> the purpose of this lecture is basically approach the space from a mathematical and physical standpoint. Now, um, time was a um, particularly physical concept. Space is actually borrowed from mathematics. Um, now, in mathematics we have many different spaces and it's kind of equivalent to the word set with certain properties. In, in physics we are talking about only one particular, I mean classical physics, we are talking about one particular set with particular properties. It's a three-dimensional continuum, um, it's a regular three-dimensional um, uh, space as known from mathematics. Now, that basically implies that um, uh, in mathematics we, we have usually the coordinate system, um, there are many different coordinate systems. This is borrowed completely from mathematics into physics. So, the classical physics considers the space around us as basically a three-dimensional, mathematically known concept and it's implied that uh, to know where exactly something happens in space we need a regular Cartesian or some other coordinate system in this three-dimensional space and I have to actually tell you that most likely we will use the Cartesian system uh, which in turn implies that we have to have a special point as origin of the Cartesian system we have to have three axes x-axis, y-axis and, and z-axis um, mutually perpendicular to each other uh, which basically define our Cartesian system and we also need a unit of measurement of the distance along each axis and this is something which we probably should talk about more in terms of physics rather than mathematics because in math we can allow anything to be the unit of um, the lengths on each, on, on each axis. In physics there are certain standards. Now the most important standard as the unit of measurement is a meter. Now um, meter is well something about that size. Um, more precisely it was defined certain time ago as um, one ten millionth of the distance from the North Pole to equator, so if this is our planet Earth, this is equator, this is North Pole, so the different the distance along the meridian, it's a quarter basically of the total meridian. So one ten millionth of this distance was um, considered to be a meter. Uh, in other words, uh, one forty millionth of the equator which roughly the same thing, especially if you consider that Earth is a, a reg regular sphere, which is not. Now, uh, obviously, contemporary physicists cannot be satisfied with this type of uh, standard, standard unit. Um, some time ago, um, they made, um, I think it was uh, an alloy of platinum and iridium, um, this metal rod actually they made and put two marks on it which was considered to be the standard for the meter and it's probably still in Paris somewhere and the duplicates of this were spread around the world in different countries and again that wasn't really uh, precise enough 
uh, well, because you have to maintain certain temperature, uh, humidity, whatever it is. Um, now, a contemporary um, standard for one meter is um, based on the speed of light in the vacuum, and it was measured, and uh, it was actually considered to be 1 over 2997924458 of the distance covered by the light in vacuum in one second. So in one second there is a certain distance which light covers in vacuum. So 1 over whatever, I can't even read it, um, of this distance is considered to be the definition of a meter. And this is very precise and obviously it is related to one second. Question is what is one second? Is it defined? Yes. In the previous lecture about the time we were talking about how one second is defined. It's something related to change of the uh, energy state in, in the atom of cesium. Uh, again, there is a certain number of these changes and <coughs> number of, a certain number of these changes is by definition is one second. So, we have defined unit of measurements for the time, that was the previous lecture, and now we have defined the international unit of measurement for the lengths. Now, obviously there are many other measurements. Um, in the United States we use miles, somewhere else we might use somewhere else, uh, and in inches, by the way, and obviously there are certain coefficients which are transforming one into another. But again, international standard is a meter, and it can be divided into thousands of a meter, which is called millimeters, millions of the meters, micrometers, nanometers, whatever, picometers, I don't know. Anyway, so, what's important is we have defined our system of coordinates, let's consider it Cartesian coordinates, which means origin, axis, and the unit of measurement of the lengths per, um, on each uh, axis. That allows us to define a position of any point in the space. Now, uh, I would like to refer you to the term of continuity. This is a very important characteristic of our space. Again, it's borrowed from mathematics. In mathematics there is a term called continuum, and that's the set which basically, for instance, the set of all um, points on the line or all points in space. Um, so we borrowed that term into the physics and we consider our three-dimensional space to be continuous in, um, in the sense that, let's say, if you take two points and the line in between, then every point on this line also belongs to the same space. So it's completely tightly packed with uh, points. There are no holes or anything like that. Every point in the space is a valid point. Okay. And every point is defined by three coordinates. Now, assume it's Cartesian coordinates. Actually, we will probably do some other coordinates, like for instance cylindrical coordinates, whenever we will study um, rotation, but it doesn't really matter. Whatever it is, it is. Right now we will consider Cartesian coordinates. Now, what's important is that if you have these Cartesian coordinates, every point can be characterized by three coordinates. Now, if this point, and we're talking about motion right now, right? So if this point is moving as the time goes by, the position becomes actually a function of time. So these three functions, which are coordinate functions, define at any moment in time a certain position, certain point A in the space. Now, that's fine. However, I would like to slightly change um, the viewpoint. You see, if you have a three-dimensional space and you have a point which something like this 
So if this is x, this is y, and this is z, then this piece would be x coordinate. Uh, uh, this piece would be y coordinates, and uh, something like this. And this piece would be z coordinate, right? Now, at the same time, I can consider these three numbers, x, y, and z, as coordinates of a vector from the origin of the coordinates to this point A. Now, well, basically, three numbers, they can obviously define the point, but uh, they can also define the vector, which goes into this point from the origin of, uh, 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 of the coordinate system, right? Now, why I would prefer to use the vector in this case? Here is why. Let's consider that your uh, point has moved from one position, let's say at moment T1, this is A1, it moves to A2, X of T2, Y of T2, and Z of T2. So it moves, this is A1, and it moves to, let's say, A2. Now, how can I specify this segment from A1 to A2? Well, I can specify it by its length, obviously, mm, and that requires the Pythagorean theorem. Uh, at the same time, if I am really uh, talking about vectors, that's much easier, because if this is not just the point A1, but this is a vector A1, and this is a vector A2, then I can always say that A2 minus A1, and this is the vector algebra, is equal to a vector which is called a displacement. And the coordinates of this vector are very easy to calculate. It's It's x2 of t minus x, I mean x2 t2 minus x of t1. That's my x coordinate, right? That's how the difference between vectors is calculated. Now, y of t2 minus y of t1, and z of t2 minus z of t1. So this is my displacement vector. Vector algebra is much more convenient when you're dealing with points in this three-dimensional space. Just because, for instance, the displacement from a point to a point in vector form is actually calculated very easily, and you know what it is. Because if you have just two points, then how do you qualify the displacement test? Yes, one thing is the length. But you still need the direction where exactly you are displacing the point A1 to the A2. So somehow you have to incorporate in, in your uh, explanation of how A1 moved to A2, you have to incorporate not only the distance, but also a direction. And that's why it's very important to have this uh, vector representation. It does not make our life any uh, more difficult. Uh, it's actually the other way around. It makes it much simpler because in vector format, format um, the motion is very easily expressed. Motion from a point to a point is expressed in vector format much easier. Okay. <coughs> I would like also, uh, above and beyond continuity of the space, which we know, um, I would like also to talk about other two very important properties. Now, the first important property is very much similar to uh, analogous property of the time. Now, remember when I was talking about time, I said that, well, if you have an experiment and it produces certain results, and then you repeat exactly the same experiment next day or next hour or whatever, you must have exactly the same results. 
that means that the time is um, homogeneous. There are no preferable point of time relative to another point of time. All moments of time are on exactly the same rights. It's uniform. The time goes uniformly. Exactly the same uniformity, but now in, in terms of location, we are applying to our physical space. So the space is uniform as far as location is considered. If you have an experiment in one particular location and then you make exactly the same experiment, which means exactly all the conditions must be exactly the same, and you make this experiment in another location, results must be the same. So this uniformity relative to location is called homogeneousness. So our space is homogeneous. That's very important. Location to location, there are absolutely no difference. This point has exactly the same space properties as another point. Again, as long as our experiment, which we repeat here and there, is exactly repeated under exactly the same conditions. So, homogeneous. The second property which I would like to point your attention to is Let's say you have an experiment in one particular location and then you turn it around. Again, our intuition tells us there should be no difference. I mean, obviously, if you are considering something like um, making an experiment in a magnetic field of the Earth and you're turning and your experiment involves somehow magnetism, then there might be certain differences. But why? That's because not every condition is exactly the same. When I'm talking about every condition, means every condition should be the same. And if you turn your apparatus, which is making your experiment, and make your experiment again, all the conditions must be the same. In case of my example about <coughs> magnetic field, obviously the condition is not the same, because the position of the apparatus relative to the magnetic field will be changed. Now, if nothing's changed, then the turning around should not really um, result in any differences in the experimentation. Intuitively we understand that that might be the case, right? And there is a special name uh, for this. Um, now we are talking about isotropic of the space. Isotropic plate. Our space is isotropic. So let me just summarize. We have continuity, obviously, but that's not uh, the physical part of the space. That's actually coming from mathematics. Now, homogeneous. Homogeneous. Something like this. I hope I spell it correctly. Homogeneous. That means that if you take your apparatus and put it in another location, must be the same result. And the third is isotropic, which means it's exactly uh, the same whether you're turning uh, or not. So this is kind of a symmetry regular to angular movement. And this is the symmetry relative to uh, transformation uh, of the position, trans uh, tra tra transposition or whatever it is. And continuity, again, as I was saying, that's coming from um, the mathematics. So these very important properties, and if you remember, we were talking about undefined concept, which we don't really want to, to point, this is the time, or this is the space. Space is also kind of undefined, but it has properties which we can really use. Now, in this particular case, we are using the property of being three-dimensional, which means we can... Um, uh, we can specify a certain coordinate system with uh, three dimensional uh, uh, th three dimensions, and it also has these properties of being homogeneous and isotropic, symmetrical, so to speak, symmetrical relative to position and symmetrical relative to angular movement. Well, um, that's basically all I wanted to share with you as far as the space is concerned. I think it should be very important to understand that space is still kind of an abstract 
um, concept which obviously uh, we, we consider that this real space which we live in corresponds to our abstract concept. So whenever we are uh, uh, studying this abstract concept of space, we hopefully, inevitably, get the properties of our own space. But again, don't forget that this classical physics is just a model of the real world. It's our model, which is in our mind. We have imagined that it corresponds to this model pretty well. Well, apparently, in the 20th century, there were newer, newer develop, developments which were more precisely um, corresponding to our real world, and that's uh, theory of relativity and quantum mechanics and whatever grew out of those things. Well, they are more precise, uh, precisely formulated models. Right now we are talking about the models which originated in 17th century by Newton, Leibniz and other guys, and uh, they correspond to our real world pretty, pretty well. Now, what, what else is very important as far as these symmetries are um, important? Well, um, there was a very interesting theorem proven um, that from these symmetries uh, we can derive certain conservation laws, like conservation of energy, conservation of momentum, etc. We will talk about these conservation laws later on, but for now I would like you really to admire the thought which was behind this that from the how now this is the space now the time we were talking about also has a continuity and it has homogen and the time is homogeneous so from the homogeneous of time we can derive the law of conservation of energy. Well, I don't know what you think about this, but quite frankly, when I learned about the possibility of this, and I'm not in, 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 in a position to present you the proof or something like this, but just admire this as a fact from something like um, uniformity or homogeneity of the time, we can derive the law of conservation of the energy. That's pretty remarkable thing. Now, and as far as these symmetries of our space, symmetry relative to, um, uh, to change of location, uh, again, also, uh, it, it, it can be proven that the result of this is the law of conservation of momentum of motion. And from isotropic uh, property of our space can be derived the law of conservation of angular momentum. Again, we didn't really talk about this. I just want you to feel how great laws, which basically guide all our um, uh, physical world, how they can be derived from symmetries, from the symmetry of the space or the symmetry of the time. Great achievements. Okay. Basically, that's all I wanted to talk about uh, as far as the space is concerned. Thank you very much and good luck.